Perfect. Nice, everything works. Nice. Hello. Um, and for the people who are online, and I think I'm looking at you at the moment, um, uh, please use the Slido to access the comment boxes. And please uh, photograph or so with your phone uh, this, this QR diagram, and then you uh, get led, or, or just type in slido.com and the number uh, 72022. You post some comments and to discuss with us uh, about whatever you want and whatever you hear. Nice. And now I have to click. Hello. Uh, I'm Merlin, and you know me from the dining hall. Uh, and, <laughs> and the people uh, up there, uh, I'm Merlin Peltz. I'm a PhD student in applied mathematics. Um, and I'm mainly, uh, or I've mainly concentrated on three different research topics uh, during my life, until now, in my bachelor's, in my master's, and now in my PhD. And these are those. So at first, numerical methods for plasma physics, and this is connected to a nuclear fusion. So the creation of uh, energy via the fusion of uh, different atoms or ions with each other in the tokamak in the nuclear fusion reactor. And then vegetation pattern formation. Um, and you see a poster right here um, of this research. This is kind of a more uh, up-to-date poster um, about my master's thesis. Uh, because in my master's thesis, I was uh, focusing on ecosystem extinction. Um, and when you analyze the vegetation patterns in dryland ecosystems and the tipping points when these patterns are going to go extinct or going to, exactly, there, there's a bare soil then, basically a bare soil state, which is a uniform state where there's no pattern anymore, then you have uh, numerically, so with your computer found um, ecosystem extinction. And this is what vegetation pattern formation is mainly about. Um, currently what I'm doing is I'm concentrating on coupled cell systems. So there are a couple of cells which are um, coupled by a diffusion field and diffusing around are the molecules which are produced intracellularly and uh, then extracellular diffusing and they are uh, creating symmetry breaking actually. So we see this already here. Our, all our cells are coupled. Um, and through that coupling of all our cells, uh, suddenly a hand is being created, or suddenly, maybe more microscopically, the hair knows that the hair cells, or the hair cells know, uh, they, can, uh, they can specialize, uh, or the stem cells at first, to hair cells, um, only through the interaction, um, and only through the group dynamics of all the cells coupled together. Similarly, when you have, hi, similarly when you have uh, fingerprints or so. Uh, fingerprints are um, uh, being created because of the nonlinear interactions with all these cells together, because they are adhering um, to each other. They would not do this uh, if they were alone. And this, is, this is what my current research is about. But today, it's about numerical methods for plasma physics. Um, nice. OK, so I'm talking about nuclear fusion. And is that really a is there really the possibility of a great energy revolution here, what we are seeing? And, and currently, it's uh, under high development, and uh, it's one of the greatest projects uh, in uh, nuclear physics at the moment. Um, but does it pay to kind of uh, follow this approach? And this is what we are going to find out today. OK, let's talk about the sun. So we are going to talk about really hot stuff today. Um, and, and, and we are going to talk about uh, also the fusion reactions which are taking place inside the sun, and this is mainly hydrogen-hydrogen fusion. Um, and actually, as you have seen, uh, maybe in my abstract, um, our resting body heat production rate of humans is actually higher than the rate of heat production in the sun. But the thing is, the sun is so big, and it's already so hot, that it does not need such a high rate. Um, it only needs to preserve its, its hotness, and, and it can totally preserve it with this hydrogen-hydrogen fusion reaction, actually. And, and we have a heartbeat. The sun is just uh, a dead kind of body. OK, okay so I'm, the outline is I'm telling you about uh, the fusion reaction itself, then how it's being made possible in nuclear fusion reactors. 
Um, then FAQ, so a few, I'm, answer, I'm gonna answer a few questions you may have about nuclear fusion, which are kind of prevalent. I think I know uh, what you're having in mind here. Um, but uh, this is gonna be very good also common knowledge to know for, for discussions and afterwards or so. Um, and maybe a few, few more questions which may be of interest. Um, and then we're gonna go to ITER, which is a nuclear fusion reactor and we may see, uh, if time permits, a, a video of ITER um, currently being built, and this is also on the next slide. Um, if not, we are straight gonna go to numerical methods, and this is what, uh, where mathematicians are needed at the moment, to develop simulations in numerical methods uh, for solving the flaws of Poisson equation for the evolution and the kinetics of the plasma inside a nuclear fusion reactor. We really have to solve this, otherwise building a reactor without the knowledge and the exact solution uh, doesn't yield anything because everything has to be exactly in place um, to make it work. Nice, so introduction. This is the ITER. So this is a tokamak. Um, it's a huge, it's a huge thing, right? You, you see it right here. Um, you see a couple of uh, cooling elements, heating elements. You see maybe around the donut, there is a kind of donut in the middle. You see um, magnetic coils, which are creating a magnetic field. Um, and also above and below the donut, there are uh, magnetic coils creating the magnetic field. Um, then you have inside the donut basically an empty space, but actually it's not that empty. There's one gram of material inside, and that is plasma. That are ions and, and uh, um, atoms which are being shot in, um, which are then uh, releasing energy we, 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 wanna, we wanna get. Because the, the, the main reason of the whole tokamak is to create energy yield for cities and, and uh, nations. Um, so everything takes place uh, inside this kind of empty donut which is super hot. So you may know that we have four different states of matter. It's solid, and if we heat up a solid thing, it becomes liquid. If we heat up a liquid thing, it becomes gaseous. Um, and then if we heat up gas, it becomes plasma. And plasma is the fourth state of matter, maybe not everybody knows about. And the difference of plasma and gas is that the plasma ions, then there are ions, suddenly, because the, the electrons are um, uh, being shot off the nuclei um, and they are just swirling around. Um, it has a large scale um, interaction uh, with each other. Every single ion has a very large scale interaction. Um, and so one single ion here has a, has, makes a difference for, for ion uh, somewhere else uh, and not just its, its direct neighbor because it creates the magnetic field and the electric field um, of the plasma itself. So we have to control this intrinsic uh, um, interaction um, with the outside magnetic fields and the uh, magnetic fields of the plasma. Yes. Okay. And, and here we also see how big this is. Uh, we see a little, little person standing over there. Um, you see in orange. And this is huge, and it's being built at the moment in uh, France, and uh, 2035 is uh, the end of the construction, and then there should be uh, some energy yield here, of the ITER reactor. Okay, nuclear fusion. Let's talk about the fusion reaction. Um, so let's consider two atoms uh, here, tritium and deuterium, which are having such a high kinetic energy, so they're having such a high speed, that they overcome the repulsive forces of the positive uh, uh, protons, possibly uh, positively charged protons, and the neutrons, they don't, don't have any charge, um, so that they overcome the uh, repulsive Coulomb, so-called Coulomb force, um, and attach each other with a bang, only if they overcome it, this repulsive force. Um, and this, this nucleus, uh, or nucleon, is unstable, and it shoots off then a neutron. Um, and then helium is being created through this fusion reaction. This is, this is one example of a fusion reaction. Okay. And to that, what is uh, interesting to know, and uh, the, one of the most 
interesting quantities is the binding energy and the overall then energy yield. We are gonna we are gonna find then afterwards. Um, but the binding energy is the difference between the um, mass of all the uh, tiny pieces, the nucleons, um, which is the number of uh, neutrons times the mass of a single neutron plus the number of protons times the mass of all the protons minus the overall mass of the whole nucleus. Um, because the overall mass of the nucleus is uh, less than the mass of all the tiny pieces because the energy goes into the binding. Um, times c squared, this is the speed of light, c is the speed of light, and then that's squared. And here I've written m of n, uh, comma c because the mass is a nonlinear function of all its uh, neutrons and protons. Um, yes. So this is the binding energy, and it's positive because we have the binding energy is, is there, it's, it's not negative. It's um, this. This is what uh, this describes because the mass, the, bind, the energy goes into uh, holding the the nucleons together. Okay. So we have a maximum binding energy for iron. Um, which has mass number 60, approximately. Um, so that means below, for elements below, so with lower mass number, um, if we, or heavier, so if you are having atoms heavier than, than iron, uh, fission leads to energy release because it's already so packed that, that something is, maybe, maybe someone of you could explain why fission, in the case of heavier atoms is uh, creating energy release, or fusion um, in the case of uh, lighter atoms um, is creating energy release. Why do you think this could be? So we have the repulsive forces, we have uh, the nucleons, we have the nucleus, um, we have protons inside, so, um, and we have a maximum energy, uh, binding energy per nucleon uh, for atomic mass number 60. Any ideas? <laughs> if not, that's okay. Um, basically, if the uh, atomic mass number is higher, the nucleus is so packed, has so many protons already, that uh, absorbing any more protons, uh, or, or we have to invest energy to be able to let it absorb more protons. We have to invest. We don't get energy release, we have to invest, and then it sticks, because we have to overcome s such large forces. For um, atomic mass number below 60, uh, it basically wants to attach uh, to other uh, nucleon, uh, nuclei, um, because it has lots of space still for, for the attachment, and then the repulsive forces can be overcome uh, easier. Um, and that means also that then fission of these uh, lighter elements then, um, there we have to put in energy because it wants to be bigger basically for the maximum binding energy and fusion for the, for the heavier ones, just, just as, as before. And here everything is just uh, again explained. So release energy via fission um, and require energy via fission for lighter elements. Um, and basically, yeah, the, the protons and with neutrons are being sucked in the nuclei, but usually with the neutrons, because protons alone um, are not very easily sucked in, um, because it would be easier to overcome the repulsive forces by uh, having an additional neutron there for binding. Okay, so now, uh, consider a general reaction between two nuclei, uh, X, and, and then we get Y out of it. So nucleus X plus A uh, gets Y plus B. Um, and here, the positive ener uh, the, the energy quantity, uh, which is the second, uh, the second quantity we, we would like to uh, have for, for analyzing our nuclear fusion um, reactions, um, is here Q, and this is the masses uh, minus the masses we have before minus the masses we have after times again C squared. And we want a positive energy quantity um, in the end. So this is what we should consider, the binding energy and the overall energy quantity. And for the fission reaction, we have here a nice 
big picture, maybe this becomes clearer now how this, how this works. So at first you have a neutron, a neutron which is speeding around and then is hitting um, a uh, nucleus um, here um, and is being absorbed. And then the nucleus is transforming and transforming so much then if the uh, kinetic energy of the um, neutron is high enough that it can't recover anymore. So it's separating into different nuclei um, and these nuclei are unstable, as they are, um, and are emitting also the next neutrons, uh, um, neutrons and uh, gamma rays also along the way. And then we see that actually it's uh, radiotoxic, what, what we are also getting, because the, the nuclei which are being created are then, um, they're not stable. Um, and they only recover a stable state after thousands of years for the fission reaction. Maybe this is different for the fusion reaction. Okay. Then, for the fusion reaction, um, we have, uh, I was debating a bit if I should put this picture inside uh, the presentation because actually the crux is not being drawn in. It's happening very close to the, um, to the um, uh, y-axis, to the force axis. Um, but you see here already the, or two of, of the main forces here in, in, in interaction with each other. The van der Waals forces, which are attracting forces of nuclei, and uh, repulsive forces like uh, the Coulomb interaction. So when you have two positive, uh, uh, or with, with magnets, uh, north, north uh, is repulsive and south, south is repulsive as well. Um, so these are the Coulomb uh, forces basically. Um, and, and proton, proton, they are, repulsing, they are repulsive, and this is a Coulomb force. And the Coulomb force uh, grows um, uh, large when the distance is small. And the Van der Waals force is, is at first smaller, uh, is, is, is there at first, it's, it's bigger than the Coulomb force, then the Coulomb force is larger, but when we are nearly touching, nuclei are nearly touching, then we get an overall drop down of the overall force response curve. So this is kind of an addition of all of the two forces. So at distance nearly vanishing, um, the nuclei are crashing into each other. And this is the fusion reaction. So we are overcoming the uh, Coulomb force then. Okay. And, and for this, uh, we have to heat the atoms to high temperatures so that we have enough uh, kinetic energy. Because what is, what is, kin what is uh, temperature or high temperature or what is heat? Heat is uh, measuring how fast the atoms in a room are uh, moving. And, and that is what, yeah, and that is what, what heat is basically, what, what we feel, how fast uh, particles are moving. Okay, now um, let's consider in the sun the fusion reaction of hydrogen plus hydrogen, which then creates deuterium plus a neutrino and plus a positron, uh, this, this beta plus. Um, and the full HH cycle um, is. Uh, written down here with these three chemical equations um, and with here the energy yield we discovered before. Um, so after the HH reaction we get uh, H plus the deuterium and we get a three helium isotope plus gamma rays and then afterwards we get uh, with three uh, helium we get a four helium plus two hydrogen atoms again. Um, and all is then creating in sum this energy, but the thing is, it's not really efficient. We need three different uh, reactions to, to get this energy yield, even when we are summing them. Um, the rate of reaction is very important here. Um, yes. Um, and for these also three reactions uh, to happen, a very high temperature constantly is needed. Okay. Way more efficient here is the deuterium tritium reaction uh, of the picture we've, we've seen before, um, creating only helium and then a, a fastly speeding out a neutron, and which is hitting then again uh, uh, different uh, nuclei and uh, is causing then also uh, different reactions along the way. Also in the re reactor planket, which is inside the nuclear fusion reactor, the donut. Um, and this energy release is uh, what you see here, 17.58 which is uh, slightly less than when you, or about as 
yeah, slightly less than when you uh, count everything here together. But the thing is, here are three uh, reactions involved, and here are here's only one reaction involved. And this is very efficient. It creates lots of energy, way more efficient than the sun can ever be um, in, in our solar system. And uh, we see also here in this diagram, this is only the purpose of this diagram is to show you the, uh, that the rate of the reaction of deuterium and tritium is the highest among all the uh, fusion reaction rates, which are reasonable for uh, nuclear fusion. Um, this is, yeah, this is kind of optimal, this fusion reaction. And this is why it's being used in the tokamaks and uh, confinement fusion in, in lasers, you will see soon. Okay, so let's go straight to methods of achieving uh, fusion energy. Okay, we've seen already the tokamak, um, and it works with uh, magnetic fields which are being created. And these magnetic fields are there to make the gas move. And when the gas is moving, it's heating up. And it should heat up so much that the plasma state is being achieved. Um, okay, and here we see the magnetic coils, and then we see here the magnetic field lines all in all, and with the right hand rule or so you, you know from physics, uh, the plasma current is then speeding around in a periodic fashion, um, just like in a circle. And the, the thing is, it is really like a circle, but even both ways. So from this way, it's a circle, it's a torus, uh, it's a donut, and also from this way, it's, it's a, a torus, so we don't get scattering, which is very nice, uh, because we, if we had a tube, then there's s stuff coming out here and stuff coming out here, but here it's being fed in again. So this is why it's uh, looking like a donut, actually. Um, and then inside, we also have some coils, yes. That is the tokamak. Also, there exists inertial confinement fusion, and for inertial confinement fusion, you have lasers which are basically as big as uh, football fields, three, three of them. Uh, they are shooting um, their lasers, their, their ions, inside a quickly uh, collapsing space, quickly confining space. Um, and because you confine it so quickly, um, you're, you're compressing the, the gas inside this, this chamber so quickly, um, everything is heating up, and then this is being ignited by this iron beam. Um, and once it's ignited, it burns. So burning means there are ongoing fusion reactions taking place inside this chamber. The thing is, though, we have to do this every single second about to create an energy yield. So this is kind of uh, uh, not very uh, cool. Um, but 2021, uh, there was actually a slight breakthrough also in confinement fusion in the Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, with the National Ignition uh, Facility. Um, but still, maybe I think the tokamak uh, is simpler to use and, and simpler to deal with. But yeah, there, there's lots of discussion what is actually the nicer way uh, uh, how to create uh, energy release in, 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 with nuclear fusion. Um, Okay, I, I can tell you more about this than later on when we talk about ITER, because actually there's something more even efficient than ITER out there already. Um, but it's also a tokamak, so not so exciting. <laughs> okay, so in the tokamak, if the plasma is hot enough, then the plasma heats up itself. But it has to be hot enough. And uh, the thing is, the, the surface of the tokamak is cooling the gas down. Um, and so it has to be refueled every over and over and over again. And the ash has to be removed. And the ash here is the helium. Um, and actually with the ash, the ash is very useful um, because the ash is being extracted outside the tokamak and then is being led to uh, machines which are creating uh, electrical uh, energy or electricity, basically. So we are actually using the ash of the tokamak um, continuously. Nice. FAQ. What's the use of all this? So you, you may think, come on, what? <laughs> Are people going crazy? Uh, this huge thing, just you, you build such a huge thing and you, you use so much men, women power, <laughs> everyone, everyone's power and, and everyone's knowledge and, and 
over over centuries, 1950 it kind of started, um, uh, we develop uh, machines for nuclear fusion um, and what is actually coming out here? So does it really work or is there really something we, we can uh, get out of this? And I'm from Germany, so I, I have access to this kind of data. This is why it stands there, the German Federal Office. Um, it recommends about 1,500 kilowatts per person, uh, kilowatt hours annually per person. Um, and let's calculate maybe a bit uh, what we can get out of one um, power plant of 1,000 megawatts electrical power. And for this, we, we need 20 grams of tritium and 13 grams of deuterium per hour, which doesn't sound a lot. But how many persons can it serve then? So if we just uh, count the number of days in, in a year, so 365 times 24 hours divided by the uh, 1.5 we have from above, we already uh, um, cancel the 1,000 factor with the 1,000 megawatts, but still it's kilowatt, and uh, kilowatt is uh, 1,000 less than megawatts, so we divide by 1,000. Uh, we get 5.84 5, million people, which can be served by such a power plant with only 175 kilograms of tritium and 113.88 uh, 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 kilograms of deuterium. So that is huge, that is really crazy um, per year. Um, but maybe one question is open. How can we get deuterium and tritium? So maybe that doesn't seem so heavy, but how can we get it? Um, so we can get it actually out of seawater um, with uh, yeah, only 0.01%, uh, 5% uh, 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 deuterium there inside seawater. It's not very high, but because we have a plenty of seawater, and actually the uh, electrolysis, distillation process, and so on is, is very efficient, this is still a very lucky number, or nice number. Um, and uh, yeah, again, we have lots of seawater. And uh, this is, yeah, this is currently what, what people are thinking about, just using the deuterium out of the, the seawater here. Okay. Then tritium is being created through the reaction of a neutron with lithium in the reactor blanket. So the reactor blanket is inside the tokamak again, and here there's a couple of, uh, there, there's uh, lead, and there's lithium in here. Um, and through this lithium plus neutron reaction, and we see that the neutron is speeding around because it's the product of the uh, deuterium uh, um, tritium reaction then itself. Um, it creates then the four helium and the tritium, and we don't worry so much about the minus uh, two, four, seven uh, mega electronic volt, uh, electron volt. Um, yes, this is how tritium is being uh, obtained. And additionally, we get additional neutrons speeding around and hitting the, uh, uh, the uh, nuclei uh, with this reactor blanket reaction with, with lead. Nice. So what does also the whole reactor consist of, not only the blanket? And uh, usually Wolfram and liquid uh, metal is being in use because it has to have a high uh, um, heat. It, it, it has to, ah, a high melting temperature, Ex exactly. So it has to stand uh, still when, when the, the plasma is hot inside, uh, when, when the plasma is basically the, the fourth uh, state of matter. Um, and after the blanket, you also have to have then, then Wolfram and uh, Gallium. Okay. Then, uh, what electrical power would uh, a fusion plant, a normal kind of fusion plant create? And this is a bit different than, than we, the slide before, uh, because it considers what are our current models of uh, fusion power plants, with how many megawatts are we currently uh, calculating. And these are 1,500 megawatts, um, um, which are currently under, uh, which were in study already in 2005, and which are also currently in study then when we get an energy yield uh, out of ITER. But the bigger, the better. The bigger the whole reactor, the better. And we will uh, come to that now. Um, energy losses 
are due to the surface, just as we uh, have seen before. Uh, so the less surface area we have, so the bigger the radius, kind of, the inner radius of the torus, and the smaller the, the kind of so outer radius, uh, the more volume it has and the less surface area. So it can stay hot and it can burn the longer. Um, the better. So um, we want we want a high radius here. We, we want a large uh, volume and a uh, small surface area. And also there's a fun fact because there's a tiny, tiny, super cute animal uh, which is called the dwarf shrew or a pygmy shrew which has a snout length of uh, four centimeters only. Um, and this is the smallest size a mammal can, can be on this earth actually. Um, and also the heart rate of this dwarf shrew is actually the fastest of any mammal. So it's kind of beating like crazy because it has to uh, warm itself up because it has such a high surface energy actually. And here it is. This is the, the tiny elephant. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay, so now let's go to the uh, kind of uh, prevalent questions. Uh, will there be any higher radiation burden near the fusion power plant in normal operation? No. The thing is, uh, the variation, radiation, uh, variation of radiation between cities is definitely higher than the uh, radiation caused by all the released tritium here um, in, the, in the blanket. So this is, this is kind of interesting to know. But, okay, not yet but. Uh, Chernobyl or Fukushima, or are events like these possible? Um, okay, so as I said, the amount of uh, material inside the tokamak at any given time is uh, one or two, one gram, uh, one gram, and that is sufficient for one minute of burning. Okay, so that is not a, that is not a lot at all. So there's not much which is super hot, but it's super hot. And the power density then inside the tokamak is just as big as a normal light bulb, actually, at any, any given uh, volume space inside the tokamak. So this is also not kind of, also not really crazy. Um, okay, and uncontrolled root huge rise of any physical power would then create actually a cooling off of all the uh, plasma. So the thing is, uh, we have to heat up the plasma to create energy release and to create this helium ash. But as soon as we have a tiny perturbation because every ion is coupled with each other in the plasma state, uh, this tiny perturbation then quickly cools off everything. Um, and, and because everything is just cooling off, everything stops. It's completely stopping. Nothing is happening then anymore. And, and so there's, there's no meltdown kind of even, even uh, it, it's, it's there's a tiny possibility of a meltdown, but it, not a meltdown of, of every single part of, of the whole tokamak, because the uh, whole concept of the tokamak is with the gallium and wolfram that, it's, uh, that it has a high melting temperature than also outside, uh, and high enough for the most energetic state and for the plasma state. So that is, uh, that is the difference here of, uh, between nuclear fission and, and fusion. Okay, if there's collapse, then not sufficient to melt components. Power plant is built to even withstand earthquakes and airplane crashes because we have lots of people uh, since the protests of uh, nuclear fission, right? Which are um, really kind of discussing against scientists or so uh, and, and don't want uh, any nuclear uh, science anymore uh, being maybe implemented by governments. Um, and they have to, uh, they have to see, maybe, that this is not exactly the same, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. It, it's very different. And the meltdown is just, as I said, uh, not, not really possible. And, and uh, yeah. OK, so airplane crashes also. Then scientists and engineers uh, aim to make, uh, have as little tritium as possible and uh, separate it in sub-inventories um, also, so, so to control the radioactive tritium here, okay? And then scientists are constantly searching for these catastro catastrophic events because they want to um, uh, create a, a 
safe and uh, safe new energy um, uh, system uh, to use than, than for the next uh, for the next years and centuries to come. Uh, so they really search also for uh, solutions for people who are very skeptic. This is what I wanted to say here, right? Um, perfect. Then, what about the waste? So we have actually more waste uh, in uh, nuclear for nuclear fission reactors than nuclear fusion uh, fusion reactors than nuclear fission reactors. Uh, one to two times as much uh, with the uh, tritium. We get out of it. Um, and this is bad, this sounds bad, but there are also good news because uh, the half period of all this stuff which is coming out and which is uh, radioactive is uh, one to five years. And this is pretty, pretty light uh, and, and much lighter than just uh, thousands of years uh, we had for nuclear fission. So there's a huge difference here, actually. Um, and it's much less radiotoxic. We've seen this before. The variation uh, is between cities is higher even um, than, uh, than uh, in the reactor blanket, the tritium, the radioactivity here. Um, and after 50 years, uh, we can, we can uh, so 30 to 40 percent can be released, and 60 percent can be put inside uh, the next reactor blanket for the next fusion reactor again. So we can make something out of it, even. So that is that is kind of nice, nice to see. Okay, so let's get maybe to Eater. If there are no questions, or do you have a question? No. Okay, perfect. Yes, uh, let's get to Eater, and maybe we can watch a short five-minute movie or so if we are uh, good in time. Um, and I think we are good in time because I need then uh, five minutes more for the numerical methods than afterwards. Um, does it work with the audio? Perfect. Nice. And so that somebody explains that to you with not all the time me, <laughs> so that you hear it from, from a different voice and also see some pictures. With more than 35 nations, 30,000 people, and a million components working together, we share one simple goal. To illuminate the way to new energy. Since the dawn of time, human beings have owed everything to the almighty sun that shares its light with all life on earth. But now, a group of 35 nations, representing more than half of the world's population, is closer than ever to unlocking the secrets of the star's source of energy, hydrogen fusion, which could deliver a clean, safe, and virtually unlimited power supply to humankind for millennia to come. Deuterium and tritium are heavy isotopes of hydrogen, by the way. To succeed, ITER and its seven primary members, China, European Union, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and the United States, must overcome some of the greatest scientific challenges ever conceived and execute one of the grandest political collaborations ever dreamed. Through the shadows of all doubt, we're building the sun on Earth. So after decades of design and preparation, 2020 marks the long-awaited launch of the ITER Assembly. It's no secret that the world needs energy. We also know that the impact of the last 150 years or so of using uh, fossil fuels has been uh, increasingly devastating. And there's a big contest as to whether we can slow down in our consumption or we can find something to replace it with a cleaner alternative. Fusion has some unique characteristics that make it pretty much the absolute perfect uh, energy source. Unlike fission, there is no possibility of a meltdown. If the reaction stops, everything just stops and that's it. It's really hard to do though. With fusion, we're reproducing the energy that's at the core of the sun and all the stars. We do it by creating a metal cage and within that metal cage, an invisible magnetic cage that will confine what we call a fusion plasma. The idea of magnetic confinement we've been doing for roughly 60 years, building bigger and bigger token back. And finally, we've gotten to this. So the ITER project, 35 countries working together for the first time to build an industrial scale machine. 
But I think it's very much redundant of here to downstairs at the central stage, and then we have all these port openings here, port turns. They remind me of the um, theatre boxes where the Empress and the Emperor mm, yeah. sort of <laughs> wave at their uh, people. Yeah. I think we will not be able to stand here and to wave at either. <laughs> this is certainly going to be um, a big theatre uh, for mankind. We have 150 million degrees inside the core of the plasma. We have uh, 12 Tesla magnetic forces. We have um, current in the system of 15 mega amps. So whatever number, figure you look at, uh, the meter is big. Without our members, we can't progress. We need them to believe and be committed uh, throughout this really long project. It's lasting many, many years. So how do you stay committed to something you have to say well for? You have to see what the progress is. So we go out, we do presentations, we meet people from the research community, from industry, policymakers. Everyone has an open invitation to come here and get a worksite tour and learn more about the project. We welcome this because it will help us reach new audiences. You know, back in Japan, maybe people don't know about here, but they are interested, definitely. I have many friends here, many colleagues, and they're doing like great job. They're hard on day, every day, going to the next. But I think, you know, we communications team have the responsibility to spread their ethics using social media, outreach. As energy needs continue to build, we want the next generation to understand how fusion energy can be important. So we bring thousands of kids here every year to actually tour the site. We also try to uh, bring in a lot of journalists who see a lot more press about each of these days. There yeah, outreach is very important for science and and for this large scale also. Thousands and thousands of people around the world on multiple continents contributing their ideas to this project to try to change the future of, of human society. You know, I'm just an intern student, but like somehow I try to contribute to this like biggest project in the world. This could change the human history. It's great to do this job. Everybody knows why we are trying to achieve fusion energy, but um, to sit in the cafeteria or in the canteen and to see all of these different nationalities uh, coming together to deliver a new source of energy that can really help us find a solution to prevent our own extinction. Join us each week as we share the stories of the entire ITER endeavor. Not just the amazing machine and the incredible science, but the hardworking people who bring ITER to life right now. Thanks for sharing, and remember, as a publicly funded project, ITER belongs to all of us, so we could not do this work without you. Thanks again, and see you next time on ITER Now. Yes, that was the motivational video. Yes. And, and as they said, it's publicly funded. All the science also we do at universities, and, and the, the physics, the math. Um, so it belongs really to all of us, and, and we um, um, should have access to all the science then, uh, in the end. And we should also have access to good explanations of science. And this is also one reason why I'm doing this talk here, to bring it to, to people, this, this knowledge, in, in a kind of compact form um, more. Perfect. So, what are uh, mathematicians doing uh, to contribute to this project? And uh, how can they weigh in? And how do they make possible that we are, uh, um, we, we are able to build these fusion reactors and we are able to uh, use nuclear fusion for energy release? Okay, so let's quickly go to numer numerical methods for plasma physics. I have, uh, I have a few more minutes, so this is very good, actually. Yeah. And then lots of questions, maybe. Um, nice. Um, OK, so let's consider for uh, the math this tokamak again, stripped off of the details. And let's maybe don't worry so much about the, the lines here, but maybe let's worry about a line which is kind of inside the tokamak. And it's one dimensional and it's periodic. It's a one dimensional line and it's a trajectory. A trajectory of a so called transport equation. And the transport equation is the law of motion of all the particles, how they have to behave, of all the plasma particles. And they are kind of on a track um, inside the tokamak. 
and every other uh, ring then is uh, very similar. It's just a shifted trajectory. It, it's just, um, uh, it depends on the radius, but it's, it's quite similar. It's, it has this property of uh, uh, being a ca characteristic of the transport equation you, you, see, you see now. Um, and so it makes sense to consider this one dimensional line at first. Also to produce numerical methods and simulations at first in one dimension and then build up to do two dimensions. Um, and so we have here the X and V space in which we are solving this uh, di uh, differential equation. Um, so the X space is our one dimensional line and it counts uh, or it gives the location on our line where we are. The V is the velocity at each given location um, in our space. Um, so we have a two-dimensional space basically abstractly. We have on the x-axis the x and on the y-axis the v. Um, so it's maybe a bit more abstract. But f gives the uh, plasma transport density inside the tokamak. Um, and it's called the transport equation because it has this transport term v and this transport term uh, Q, so the charge of the plasma particle times E, the electrical field, over M, the plasma particle mass, in front of the V term. We can also write this in, in compact form so that we see transport terms here. Um, yes, uh, and you can use the method of characteristics. We cover that there are these tra trajectories which are always being preserved, and what is being pushed forward are only the positions, not the density of the plasma. Um, okay. So far to that, but that is not everything because we know that the electrical field is being also uh, um, produced by the plasma itself and not only by the electrical field or the, the magnetic uh, coils and then outside the tokamak, also the, the plasma itself is in interaction with itself. Um, and so this is a Flasov Poisson equation because it's coupled to the Poisson equation you see here in the middle. And the epsilon naught is just for the units. It can be here set to zero for numerical purposes. Um, and uh, the, the rho is the charge density if we integrate over this line. So if we sum over all uh, f on, on our uh, uh, periodic line. Okay. And that electrical field is the minus the derivative. So we, we know that velocity is the derivative of, uh, of the location. And E is minus the derivative of the uh, scalar potential phi here. Everything has to be solved at each time step to be able to recover the solution here. Okay. How are we going to go about this? We're going to discretize the domain. Um, and the smaller the step of discretizing the domain, the better. And here's our one-dimensional line. And we set points here, 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 here. Um, discrete points, and in between there's nothing. Normally, uh, when we have two points, uh, then in, in real life, there are infinitely more, many points in between. These are the, this is the property also of the real numbers, that we have infinitely many points in between, but the computer can't deal with infinitely many numbers, so we have to discretize here to be able to get a solution. So this is the crit in X, this is the crit in V, and then we have a two-dimensional space, so we have this discrete uh, uh, grid, two-dimensional grid then, okay? On this grid, we write our transport density as a sum of computational particles, which are weighted. So the computational particles are artificial particles, which are kind of a, a bunch of real particles, a bunch of real plasma particles. Um, they are collecting this bunch, and how much of this bunch is inside is uh, inside the weight function at time step n and k for the kth computational particle. We know from the transport equation that only the xk, so the centers of these computational particles, is uh, uh, evolving in time because we are always going on trajectories uh, inside the tokamak. And so um, this shape function, you can also write this, this whole thing from here to here inside, uh, or you can denote this as a shape function which is two-dimensional. This is evolving um, because only the centers of the particle of the shape function is evolving. 
um, and then weighted just uh, by this W. And this is what I said already. This is not so important maybe to explain. This is just the this, it weights the bunch of particles. And a convenient choice for this shape function is a blurry kind of uh, ball. And this, this blurry kind of ball is called a B-spline here uh, of degree three so that it's smooth. Okay, what is a B-spline? A B-spline is this. So a B-spline of degree uh, zero is just this step function. So you just, and it measures if here are particles. So here are plasma particles. If there are plasma particles, then it gives just a zero if there are none, and then suddenly it gives a one if there are plasma particles. So basically a yes or no. Um, if you smooth this function, you get this head function. So this is the next smoother b spline function. This is B1. The next one is even smoother. So that is the aqua uh, b spline function B2. And the next smooth, smoother b spline function is B3. And in two-dimensional space, this doesn't look like this bump anymore or this Gaussian anymore. It looks like a blurry uh, circle. Um, and in three dimensions, it's, it's really a ball. And then in higher dimensions, it's a higher dimensional ball or whatever. And this is collecting plasma particles inside so that we don't have to push forward every single plasma particle because there are lots, there are millions of them. Nice. Okay, so we only have to push forward the positions uh, V at first by this splitting method, by, by this time-stepping method, so-called. And here we come now to the math. Here we come to the numerical simulation. Um, we only have to push forward the uh, V, so the velocity, at time step uh, N minus one-half to the next time step N plus one-half a time step. So this seems kind of maybe complicated because it's one half a time step. And here there's one time step. So, so we kind of assume that we can also do this for V, but we can't because in this case we use something called maybe Rikunos strang splitting or a leapfrog method. Um, and strang splitting is Hamiltonian splitting, which preserves the Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is another word for the energy of our whole system. If we preserve our energy of the system, um, then we can, uh, even though we may get uh, numerical er errors or oscillations, oscillations are, or jumps in our solution, so which make it kind of look coarse grained, it, uh, the whole evolution of uh, our particles, computational particles, um, is as it would be in real life because also in real life we have energy cons conservation then, if everything is nicely isolated inside the tokamak, and uh, momentum um, conservation. Okay, this is, this is Hamiltonian splitting, and by that we push one by one by one by one by one our uh, particle uh, locations forward. We just plug this in here and just plot it, and then we have our solution. And, and here we see delta t times v, which is giving us a, a delta t, T times the velocity is again a location, and this may look familiar. Nice. And here's an example of an initial profile, so that is not initial anymore, that is after 56 time steps, the plasma uh, transport density inside XV space, but I'm gonna show you a video um, of this initial so-called two-stream instability, um, which is basically a stream here and a stream here, so a bunch of particles here, and a bunch of particles then in another band above. And that means that if we point x, there are always particles with uh, about minus two speed uh, and about two speed, which are hitting each other. And we want that they are hitting each other because we want to create nuclear fusion. Um, and especially this, that we want this, is creating lots of shocks inside our gas. And these shocks are creating numerical instabilities, and this is why we have to proceed this way and not by uh, easier, maybe, simulations. We have to use particle incel methods to be able to deal with this uh, highly oscillating uh, um, equation and initial condition, uh, which is um, getting us to, to uh, highly oscillating solutions. Okay? 
So the picture is for the two stream instability with 400 computational particles with the pick method. So this is what I call the full F method. This we start with the two streams and then we get this picture, two streams, then we get this. The thing is though, we see already filaments here. Normally we would like to see a smooth, a smooth plasma here. But the thing is we see these filaments, these kind of grains inside, and this is already a numerical instability. It's already giving us something we would not have in real life. But overall the dynamics, the evolution of this thing you see here, um, is uh, preserving the Hamiltonian, the energy, and therefore what we have in real life, even though it does not exactly look like it. This is why I uh, did my, um, was a student researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics and was helping uh, with developing new methods of these particle insulin methods, which are dealing with these uh, um, fast uh, obtained oscillations and, and instabilities. So here we remap the whole plasma density back along the trajectory and then push forward again and remap back with what we know is the exact solution and only push forward a variation of what we already obtained as a, the exact solution before. How this looks is uh, like this. This is the so-called FBL, forward, backward, Lagrangian, it's called. Um, wait, where's my mouse? Here. Delta F method. And it is with 400 particles here. So the remapping you see at each tenth time step, then it becomes smooth again, smooth, smooth, smooth. So it throws away all the errors. All the errors are thrown out and then pushes forward with the pick method. And that creates then uh, a much better scheme. And uh, with this, we are building up to also a 2D, 2V version of the uh, um, uh, plus of Poisson equation solution. And by this, we are contributing to this whole project then in the end. And that is, when I'm closing this, and this, my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> And here are my references. Yes, Petro. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, okay, my f I have like different questions, but the yes, first yes. one and I pass yes. the mic, my, yes. the mic to the other person. You say that in the slide in which you talk about radiotoxicity of uh, fission yes. and fusion, yes. I have two questions that are that go together. First of all, how yes. do you define radiotoxicity? Thanks for being there? here, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. How do yes. you define radiotoxicity there? Yes. And how can it be? No, I think it was in FAQ. Less toxic, right? Yeah. yeah. High durability, electrical power heater. No. Before, right? No. I recognize that you shake your head somewhere. Oh, no, the last one. So the... Uh, you say, in somewhere it was something like, yeah, here. Nice. You say it's much less radiotoxic? Yes. Two questions. First, yes. how, do you def how do you refine radiotoxicity? In what yes. units? Yes. I guess in something like absorbed dose or something like that? Yes. And second, how can it be that if I have something that has a half period much smaller than something, if I have a period which is five years and mm -hmm. I have more waste, mm -hmm. if I have a period, if I have a shorter period, that means that my thing is uh, disintegrating faster, mm -hmm. which if I had uh, two emissions with the same energy, that mm -hmm. would mean that my energy is going f uh, faster. Mm -hmm. Is it because like, what are the differences in the radioactive uh, mm. waste yep. that we have? Yeah. Is it because we have like gamma radiation or alpha radiation in one kind? Yes, yes. The thing is, I'm not a physicist. 
Um, and this part of the FAQ and the whole FAQ I took out of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics FAQ, actually. So this, this was uh, my, my second reference. So I do not know how they define radiotoxic. Um, but this is basically an introduction for my math I then gave, gave then afterwards, but we needed this introduction kind of for explaining. But it, it's good that you ask because this is important for, for all the people. Also, maybe on Slido we have some questions. No. Uh, yes. I mean, I'm yes. okay with... How could we define radiotoxicity oh, here? There are different... I, it depends. I was asking because I, I know like three different ways of defining it. Yes. Depending on what you are defining it, for, and I was curious to see like how like intuitively for me it doesn't make sense that it's something yes. disintegrates faster and you have a, a higher quantity yeah, of it. Yeah, it, it shoots it's less off, toxic. It shoots up faster. But, the, but the I'm okay with radiotox. Like I don't think that's a problem. Yeah. Like yeah. not even for fusion. Like I think that's yes. okay. Yes. But I was just more curious to see like how yes, can yes. it be. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> would be nice to know though. Yes, exactly. When it's degrading faster. Uh, yeah, there are still gamma rays for both reactions. We, we got gamma rays for, we don't get any other rays, right? Alpha or beta rays. We get gamma rays for both fission and fusion. For fission, we have beta. So ah, also beta. Alpha. Okay, yeah. okay. It depends on what reaction we have, but we do have beta reaction and alpha reaction as well. Okay. I have not seen uh, beta for uh, fusion reactions, uh, beta rays. Well, I guess for, fus for fusion, as you are disintegrating hydrogen, mm. I guess it wouldn't, like, how are you going to have beta? Like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, so I guess I it see. would be something like gamma, because it's, yeah. and if it's gamma, yeah. then I don't see how it can be less radiotoxic. Yes. I, I know that, like, for sure, like, the people who wrote this, like, yeah, so, but, yeah. Just... but we should check these people who wrote this, and you should check on me. <laughs> that, that is interesting. Uh, and, and that is important. Um, yes, uh, so they're shooting off these neutrons also then in the degrading process, right? And if you're shooting off, off neutrons, which are not radiotoxic, I don't know. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I don't know any question. Maybe somebody on Slido has the answer. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Any more questions? Nice. I've got one, um, not a mathematician or a physicist question, but on your... Um, visual model as you're doing at the end, what's yes. the time frame of one time step? Yes. Uh, the time frame is uh, non-dimensionalized, so um, I don't know. <laughs> um, but the time frame is, how can I recover the time frame? It, when we apply this whole system to the current plasma, then we, um, ah, I can actually show you something more. Um, here we have Q and M. Um, which are the charge and the mass of plasma particles. Already this, that this is just the charge and the mass of a plasma particle, is very hand wavy, right? Mm -hmm. Could be this ion or it could be a different ion or so. So it is a, for one single species of plasma particles at a given point on this line inside the, on, on one trajectory. Um, so it's very general. And, the, and it's non-dimensionalized. And this is what people usually are doing in math. We are at first non-dimensionalizing and recovering uh, and combining all parameters we can to one parameter so that we have as less parameters we can wiggle around as possible to be able to fix or to vary these, these uh, different parameters in our equation. Here we have, uh, for example, this epsilon naught as a parameter, um, but Otherwise, it's quite parameter-free, uh, but with, except for Q and M. Um, so this is quite a compact form of this whole equation. Um, so this is done when you go from physics to math. We non-dimensionalize, make it abstract, and make it, therefore, in the abstraction process, and therefore it's really worth it, valid for many, many species of particles at once. So the only theory which is developed here, and uh, the simulations written here, can be... Um, apply to many different particle species and uh, different parameter values. And this is kind of, this is the power of here, the mathematics. Um, but the thing is, uh, when you ask me these questions, I, I don't know uh, what, what the time, uh, time frame read here is. Yeah. Interesting. Nice. Rodney, do you have a question? Yes. Um, 
I don't know if you have the answer to this, mm -hmm. but I know with Eater, um, it mentioned that it was like a collaboration of different like yes. countries. Yes. And we know right now there is a bit of a yes. elephant in the room. Well, yes. not really. Yes, 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 um, yes. Uh, in terms of Russia. Mm -hmm. So do you think like the ongoing conflict or I guess the ongoing conflict in Ukraine will impact the sort of uh, established deadline for 2035 in terms of the completion of this project? Mm, I don't think so because um, uh, different reasons. Um, first reason is uh, this whole endeavor was already uh, uh, organized um, in the Cold War and was also already being executed then. So the first steps toward the ITER during the Cold War. Um, already then, uh, the US and uh, the uh, Soviet Union, they were both together working on uh, the science behind nuclear fusion since the 1950s and uh, the late 1950s and early 1960s. So we see here, which is super nice, a decoupling of political ideas and the science. And this is wonderful. This is really beautiful. Um, and this, I think, goes on also right now because it, it is decoupled because the scientists are so international. Um, we are collaborating with, at UBC also from, uh, with scientists all over the world, but also in social sciences, you're just collaborating with all over the world. This is academia. Um, and especially this uh, theoretical physics is very academic and very co collaboration heavy because we have really tough questions and we want to solve them. And uh, we need every single one of us in this world and no matter which culture, which nationality, which gender, whatsoever, this is all not important. And that is so beautiful. Um, in the end, it's only about our ideas and our um, sparks we can, we can create here. Um, yes, uh, so I don't think so. Um, and even during the pandemic, it was just going on, just nearly as normal. Uh, 2000. 30 was kind of planned before the pan pandemic, and then 2035 is now kind of the, um, the, the time, the deadline. And then afterwards, even another reactor is being built. It's called DEMO, and it's even larger of scale. And this is the first reactor uh, which is creating a high energy yield, which can be implemented uh, or which can be built inside cities uh, to create uh, really nuclear fusion for, for cities and nations and afterwards after we test ITER and get our scientific results and from that at first, yeah. Wait, is this okay. still being recorded? Because I have another dumb question. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the heaven up there? Yeah. The internet heaven, yeah. So the question is, I'm graced to hear about fusion in a super large scale. Given climate and polit political disruptions to transmission, do fusion reactors work at small slash micro scale? What was the first part of the question? That this person has heard about fusion ah. in a super large scale. Yes, yes. So does it work at a small or micro scale? Ah, for, for small villages. I don't know this about villages, means? but... In the, pen, in, in the uh, what was the middle? Given climate and politics disruption. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Um, this is quite connected to uh, Rodney's question, actually. Um, if you have such a large scale project and, uh, and then it's just uh, interrupted the whole project or nobody wants to work uh, on it anymore, um, it's just not happening anymore. The thing is, we need large scale uh, um, machines here, we need a large scale tokamak because of the surface to volume ratio here. Um, so the thing is even uh, DEMO and an, another reactor called Wendelstein, uh, which is at the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics where I worked, uh, they are much more efficient, um, but the Wendelstein is actually a bit smaller. Um, and it's also tokamak, but it has a couple more differently uh, positioned electrical coils and magnetic fields are being created than, than by this, uh, which are different than from the ITER tokamak. Um, and so people are currently working on this. Um, and they have been working on this since the 50s. And the th 
thing is people thought in the 50s they would uh, be working on such a huge project and uh, such a crazy nice new interesting project all the physicists were kind of storming to that research area and then they found out oh it's pretty intense that that we have to develop so much theory that we have to build so large scale um, and uh, it cannot really can it, can it be uh, built up uh, small scale? Um, Wendelstein is the smallest I know of. Maybe maybe you can Google Wendelstein uh, for in Garching. Um, but still, that one is pretty big, and you need all the people working together to make it possible. And you need all the theory uh, to to make it possible. So you can maybe try in your uh, in your backyard to to build a fusion reactor. <laughs> but the thing is, you you really need lots of uh, human power uh, and all the people coming together here um, and the science is under development right now and it took already 100 years and already the first generation who worked on plasma physics and nuclear fusion has died so their kind of dream did not come true but they passed it on to the next generation so that now the dream maybe can come true in the next uh, few centuries or so maybe Any more questions? Nice. If not, then thank you for being here. You can also take a look at my poster then afterwards. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>